morning, everybody. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cabanero and the organizers for inviting me to speak today. The topic I'll be discussing is anticoagulation and continuous kidney replacement therapy. Disclosures, I do receive up-to-date royalties for the pediatric AKI chapter. I have none other to uh, disclose. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the rationale for anticoagulation when you do continuous kidney replacement therapies. Focus a little bit on heparin citrate, prostacyclin, some of the special situations that we encounter in pediatric critical care, and some of the outcomes associated with different types of anticoagulation. So why is it relevant uh, to CKRT? Well, functional circuit life is really one of the key things and one of our goals. And that really allows us to maximize dose delivery, uh, staff satisfaction in terms of not having to uh, change the um, circuits all the time. And also it minimizes patient morbidity. Uh, so less of a changing of the lines and minimizes cost to uh, therapy uh, because of multi-circuit use. It should be uh, readily available, consistently delivered via protocols, safe above all, easily monitored, commercially available, and associated with a low side effect profile. There's a variety of options that have been used, and they do, uh, they are a little bit disparate in adult versus um, pediatric uh, CKRT experience. Saline flushes, um, heparin, we do have fairly good pediatric experience in. Uh, as well as uh, citrate regional anticoagulation. Some of the others, low molecular weight heparin, prostacyclin, uh, nefamostat, uh, danaproid, iridin, and argatroban. So <clears throat> understanding that um, blood will clot if you allow it to, the sites of thrombus formation often seen in the CKRT circuit include the surface blood interface, so the hemofilter, blood lines, catheters, uh, areas of turbulence to flow, so where we have stopcocks or lure locks, and uh, there's some pediatric specific challenges that we all see. So smaller catheter use, slower blood flows. Do we really need anticoagulation for CRT? Well, there was a couple of uh, fairly massive studies out now um, 12, uh, 15 years ago, and they looked at the intensity of renal support in critically ill patients. It was a VA NIH acute uh, renal failure trial network, and also the renal replacement therapy study um, out of Australia and New Zealand. And so when they looked at their um, intensive versus less intensive strategies, you can see in this box uh, outlined here that the majority of, um, of their circuits uh, did not employ anticoagulation. And so uh, you can see heparin and citrate were, were the other two common ones uh, used. And if you look at uh, the renal replacement trial um, study, the type of anticoagulation received, uh, um, more often than not, patients received heparin rather than anticoagulation. But you can see there's a fair number of circuits that were utilized no anticoagulation in the space in these adult trials. So let's talk a little bit about why we have to use anticoagulation in pediatrics. So heparin, most of us um, are familiar with heparin. It's a very commonly used anticoagulant, very commonly used medication across the board. And, you know, it interacts at a variety of different places within the, um, the uh, blood clotting pathway. And you can see these arrows point to the various different areas uh, where you can see heparin's impact on uh, not allowing clotting. And low molecular weight heparin uh, also is employed in this um, uh, environment as well and is successful in some cases. So what are the theoretical advantages of low molecular weight heparin? Well, there's a reduced risk of bleeding and less risk of hit, but there's some challenges because there's no quick antidote. There is an increased cost to this and uh, the studies so far have really um, realized no difference in filter lifespan. In terms of protocols, uh, heparin infusion prior to the filter with post filter um, ACT measurements and heparin adjustment based on those parameters uh, is the commonplace. There are multiple different protocols available. Generally people bullets with 10 to 20 units per kilo of heparin and infuse heparin at 10 to 20 units per kilo per hour. They adjust the post filter ACT uh, to between 180 and 200 seconds. 
and the intervals of checking are based on local standards and varies uh, from one to four hour increments. Some of the risks with heparin protocols, patient bleeding, certainly we've seen that, particularly in our youngest patients, uh, unable to inhibit a clot-bound uh, thrombin. And there is ongoing thrombin generation even in the face of heparin. Um, it can activate and damage platelets and lead to thrombocytopenia in some cases. What about citrate? How does citrate work? Well, citrate uh, really clots calcium dependent mechanisms and removal of calcium from blood will inhibit clotting. That's why the blood bank um, works. And adding citrate to blood will bind the free calcium or the ionized calcium in the blood and there, therefore inhibit clotting. And you can see citrate's uh, activation is really throughout the clotting, both intrinsic and extrinsic pathway cascades. So it really has a significant impact uh, on the ability to clot. How do we use citrate? Well, in most protocols, citrate is infused post-patient, but pre-filter, often at the arterial side of the access that is used for CKRT. Uh, calcium is then returned to the patient independent of the dual lumen um, uh, hemofilter access or can be infused by a, a third lumen of the triple lumen access. I use this uh, historic slide um, just to honor my mentor, Tim Bunchman, who, who came up with this. But this is really one of the first protocols that was developed for um, citrate anticoagulation. And it is based on um, multiple uh, different um, studies now. And variations of this have been used in many different spaces. And it's uh, quite successful. What about some of the technical considerations? So we often measure patient and system ionized calcium in two hours, and then at six to eight hour intervals, depending on how well the patient's doing and how well the clotting's doing. Pre-filter infusion of citrate, we usually aim for a system ionized calcium of 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 millimoles per liter, and we'll adjust based on our uh, levels. And for systemic calcium infusion, we aim for a patient ionized calcium of uh, 1.1 to 1.3 millimoles per liter. And again, we can adjust for levels. Advantages of citrate, uh, no need for heparin. There's uh, commercially available citrate solutions, certainly in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Uh, there's less bleeding risk. It's quite simple to monitor and our uh, bedside nurses are able to do this uh, relatively independently. And again, many protocols exist and they've been adapted and, and expanded based on the situation of the patients. What about some of the problems? So citrate is metabolized in liver and other tissues, and it can be associated with um, post-CKRT recalcitrant uh, hypercalcemia. There's also been some association with electrolyte disorders, including hypernatremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and in uh, babies, uh, cardiac toxicity. Now, I must note that in the neonatal heart presence and the amount of uh, citrate used in these patients, uh, and this was usually for uh, locking catheters and things like that. Uh, certainly, uh, those doses of citrate were very much higher in this space. So in, um, in our patients, uh, I think we do not see this issue uh, very commonly, if at all, anymore. But it's just something to be aware of. So what about complications of citrate? Metabolic acidosis. So uh, metabolic alkalosis, sorry, metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis is due to citrate conversion to bicarbonate. And if you utilize um, CKRT solutions with 35 milliequivalents of, of bicarbonate, uh, or if the patient has excessive NG losses or are being treated with um, TPN with a high acetate component, um, you can see uh, this develop over time. So some of the uh, opportunities we've had, we've changed our replacement or dialysate solutions uh, to utilize 25 milliequivalents of bicarbonate. Those are commercially available. And in cases where you're having challenges with this, you can certainly increase the CKRT clearance rate to clear more citrate. Citrate and calcium are cleared uh, with a, uh, if you, or with a uh, clearance coefficient of around one, which means they're essentially cleared readily by any uh, filter that we use. Some other complications, citrate lock. We see this uh, with increased patient total calcium concentration um, and a decreased patient ionized calcium. So essentially uh, delivery of citrate exceeds the hepatic metabolism and CKRT clearance. 
So how do we approach this? Well, we treat this by decreasing or holding, uh, stopping the citrate for one to four hours, and then restarting at 70% of the prior rate or increasing the CRT clearance, because once again, uh, we're uh, through adjusting your uh, dialysate or filter replacement fluid clearances. And uh, this helps uh, because again, the uh, dialysis coefficient for citrate and calcium, even complex is, is very good. So what's better, heparin or citrate? Well, if you look at this old um, electron microscopy, uh, and it's, it's very old now, but you can see um, on the right panel here, uh, this is citrate. You can see it's quite clean and quite clear. Or, sorry, on the left panel. On the right panel here, you can see that uh, there's multiple clotting. And so this is where heparin was utilized and the left side is where um, citrate was utilized. So it certainly appears that citrate is more effective. And what do we see in the literature? Well, certainly in adults, um, this has been evaluated by several groups. Anchi, um, uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, looked at the, um, the clotting of spontaneous failure, uh, failure of hemofilters according to the anticoagulation groups. And the median filter life was 70 hours with citrate and 40 hours with heparin. Uh, fewer um, packed red blood cells were transfused in the citrate group compared to the um, heparin group. And certainly, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, it, it is correlative of that uh, finding. Um, Morgera looked at 209 adults. They had a regional anticoagulation, trisodium citrate versus standard heparin protocols, customized calcium-free dialysis fluid. Citrate was the sole anticoagulation used in 37 of their patients. 87 patients received low-dose heparin plus citrate, and 85 patients received only heparin. Both groups receiving citrate um, anticoagulation had prolonged filter life compared to the um, heparin anticoagulation group, and they calculated significant cost savings due to prolonged filter life when using citrate-based anticoagulation protocols. Sean Bagshaw <clears throat> from uh, Edmonton or sorry, yeah, from uh, Alberta, uh, actually uh, looked at 87 patients, 54 received citrate anticoagulation, 29 received heparin, and four received um, saline flushes. And you can see the corresponding filters that were utilized in this space, depending on their um, uh, protocol for anticoagulation. So <clears throat> once they decided to use um, kidney replacement therapy, they looked at uh, for any contraindications to the use of heparin, um, was the patient hemodynamically stable? Uh, if yes, then they went with uh, intermittent saline flushes uh, or intermittent um, uh, anticoagulation with heparin. If no, then they went to citrate CVVHDF versus um, CVVHD, uh, CVVH with heparin. And they monitored a variety of different prescriptions noted here. What did they find uh, in their um, study? They noted that um, the, uh, there was significant um, performance improvement when citrate anticoagulation was utilized in this space. So once again, another study demonstrating the superiority of uh, citrate anticoagulation in continuous kidney replacement therapy. What about pediatrics? Well, this, as far as I know, still stands as uh, one of the largest um, studies in this space. Um, this was the prospective pediatric CRT group. Uh, we had 138 patients uh, composed of 442 circuits, three centers utilized heparin only, two utilized citrate, and two centers switched during the course of the study from heparin to citrate. Uh, you can see 230 circuits were utilized overall with heparin, 158 with citrate, and 54 had no anticoagulation. And the circuits were um, survival was censured for uh, schedule changes, unrelated patient issues. So having to take the patient down to a CT scan and having to uh, pause the uh, CRT, death or withdrawal support and um, regaining of renal function or change to uh, intermittent hemodialysis. What did we see? Very clearly in this space, there wasn't a lot of significant difference between heparin and citrate in the pediatric cohort. Uh, what we did notice though, was that having no anticoagulation uh, really resulted in dismal uh, circuit life and ongoing uh, failure. 
So <clears throat> in this space, uh, we're very concerned that uh, not using anticoagulation was really um, not the way to go in pediatrics. And you can see we had a number of circuits that went down for uh, other reasons, uh, including those that were clotted, schedule changes, uh, patient issues, access malfunction, or um, high filter pressure. But again, no big difference between uh, citrate and heparin. Well, how does it affect our lines? Again, we uh, um, did a further analysis on this. And, and obviously, since access malfunction and elevated um, pressures can also signify circuit clotting, we did an, an additional Kaplan-Meier analysis where circuits uh, change for elevated filter pressure, access malfunction, we're no longer censored uh, for log rank analysis. And uh, again, once again, circuits receiving either heparin or citrate had uh, demonstrated similar survival times. And, you know, we've often uh, thought that our smaller catheters clot much easier. And that is probably the case in the face of, of uh, no anticoagulation. But even from a variety of different uh, uh, French size um, intraluminal caliber um, challenges here, we didn't really notice any filter difference survival uh, with any of these access sizes um, for patients that either had heparin or citrate anticoagulation. So they both seem to be uh, very viable and reasonable in the pediatric world. Um, the complications uh, for our heparin anticoagulation, we saw 11 cases of systemic bleeding, um, five cases using no anticoagulation use secondary to bleeding. Um, uh, Five patients were changed over to that, so they didn't have bleeding, changed over to no, no anticoagulation. Uh, one case of HIT, a heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And in terms of citrate, 19 cases uh, of metabolic alkalosis were noted. One of uh, the uh, patients was changed to heparin for prolonged hypo, hyperglycemia, and one was changed to heparin for alkalosis. Three uh, cases of citrate lock were also noted. And of course, in the case of citrate, we're able to mitigate uh, the metabolic alkalosis as well as the citrate lock by the um, methods that I mentioned in a couple of previous slides. What about prostacycline? Well, this has become utilized by more and more centers. Um, PGI2, platelet aggregation inhibitor, uh, its vasodilatory effect uh, hits at about 20 nanograms per kilo per minute. It's got um, a half-life of about two minutes. Uh, it has a platelet effect um, at two to eight nanograms per kilo per minute. And again, the half-life is about two hours. Once again, in pediatrics, we do have limited clinical experience, although my colleague, Dr. Um, Akash Deep, uh, really has utilized this, um, and he's at King's College in London. He's utilized this protocol very successfully. So looking at some of the um, opportunities here, this is 51 patients, again, an older study now, 230 circuits using CVVH. Uh, they started the uh, PGI-2 at four nanograms per kilo per minute. Uh, what they noticed was uh, there was four patients with um, quite major bleeding. And so this can be certainly a challenge uh, utilizing um, uh, PGI-2 in this space. You can see there wasn't a big change in the number of platelets uh, from days from starting um, CVBH, but certainly as the um, circuit duration um, became more and more prolonged, there was an increase in the risk of circuit failure. So what about comparison to citrate? So 17 patients versus 15 patients, they were um, put in either the PGI2 group or citrate group. Um, PGI-2 was um, uh, started at 4 to 10 nanograms per kilo per minute and titrated as necessary, plus heparin. 2.2% uh, uh, citrate solution, or ACD citrate, was utilized. The median filter survival in the uh, PGI-2 group was 26 hours and 36.5 hours in the anticoagulation group using citrate. Uh, there was a note that the bleeding risks and, and the costs were higher for the PGI-2 group. What about other considerations when we're uh, doing anticoagulation? Uh, liver failure, that's a big one and been lots of discussion on this, certainly in the literature and in many meetings. Other uh, extracorporeal support, uh, tandem therapies like plasma exchange and, and unique circumstances like neonatal CRT, which is CKRT, which is becoming more and more relevant now that our equipment uh, ability 
has significantly improved with the presence of uh, devices like carpe diem or neonatal CKRT. So what about liver failure? Well, it's a unique circumstance because patients are coagulopathic and they certainly have a decreased clearance of citrate. There's an enhanced bleeding risk uh, due to all the um, clotting factors that are disrupted in liver failure. And so question is, all of us have asked, is should CKRT circuits in patients with hepatic failure be anticoagulated? Uh, and though common, um, citrate anticoagulation was not associated with increased adverse events on in pediatric liver failure patients on CKRT re receiving regional citrate anticoagulation. The fi filter life was adequate and the uh, regional citrate anticoagulation appeared to be effective anticoagulation in patients with pediatric liver failure. And so this is published here. Uh, it was published uh, five years ago now, but I think is really an important paper because it really shows us that uh, we have the capabilities to utilize citrate anticoagulation in patients with liver failure. Uh, they do still get clotting. And so it really uh, is a challenge in this space. We just have to be very careful on how we monitor the calcium and bicarbonate levels. So what about other extracorporeal support? Uh, high heparin doses for ECMO or LVADs uh, are used. There's no data su to suggest benefit or risk of additional circuit heparin or regional citrate anticoagulation in this situation. So if we have patients that are on ECMO or on LVADs and receiving high dose uh, heparin, there really doesn't appear to be a need, does not appear to be a need for additional anticoagulation. So from a personal recommendation, I would not add any um, anticoagulation in this setting. It should be uh, plenty of anticoagulation on board to maintain the circuits. What about neonatal TPE? So um, again, uh, there's a reduction in hepatic uh, metabolic function. Um, you can complicate citrate for the uh, reasons I mentioned previously. Uh, there may be a predilection for intracranial bleeds, and that certainly complicates our use of heparin in these patients. Um, small access, again, uh, complications, no anticoagulation use. And again, I do not recommend that in pediatric patients. So just from a personal recommendation, uh, using, using citrate anticoagulation with ADCA citrate at 50% of the standard rate to start with, and then checking ionized calciums every 30 minutes, and then two hours, and then six hours as the patient demonstrates stability in their numbers and obviously uh, in their um, um, physical parameters. So, you know, overall in, in, in neonates, heparin and citrate anticoagulation, again, are the most commonly used methods. Again, heparin can uh, increase the risk of bleeding. Citrate, we know about alkalosis and citrate lock. And um, there was a real uh, nice paper that was published just a couple of years ago now, um, looking at um, regional, anti regional citrate anticoagulation for continuous kidney replacement therapy in newborns and infants, and really focusing on the citrate accumulation. So there are some new potential guidelines for citrate loading in, in neonates particularly. Anyways, um, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, it's always about the kids, and I hope um, that you have uh, at least um, have some appreciation of the um, significance of making sure that we use anticoagulation in our patients receiving CKRT, even in special circumstances. Uh, no anticoagulation really is, uh, should not be an option in this space. We can always find a way to get it done appropriately. With that, I want to say uh, thanks once again, and I look forward to seeing you all in person very, very soon. Take care.